There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir, they have the car stopped in town at the branch, Michael Biden. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, a 27-year veteran of the NYPD. And with me tonight, I have, straight out of Brooklyn, Phil Grimaldi. How are you doing tonight, Phil? I'm doing pretty good, Billy. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. I'm looking forward to covering this case. We haven't uh, spoke about it in a long time, but we'll get right to it. And we also have a treat with us tonight. Uh, a crowd favorite, <laughs> straight out of the Bronx, retired NYPD sergeant and professor at Albertus Magnus College, Mike Geary. How you doing tonight, Mike? Good, Billy. Thank you for having me. Good evening, Phil. <laughs> it's going to be a, a Good great evening, show. Mike. Oh, what, How are you? One of the things we uh, are covering tonight, of course, everyone or many people have seen the picture that the law firm released of Gabby Petito based on the civil suit. Now, I'm going to put that, put that picture up on the screen right there. It's sort of horrific because this was taken, it was a selfie, and it was taken two minutes before um, her vehicle was stopped, her and uh, Brian Laundrie, before the Moab police stopped their vehicle and pulled them over. And in, in no way did we see... Um, did we see this type of injury on the police officer's body cam? So we're very concerned uh, with, did Gabby perhaps cover this up with makeup and covering her abuser? That's not uncommon for an abuser to do something like that. Because nowhere, when we look at the body cam, and we've looked at it numerous, numerous times, nowhere did we see an injury like that. And it's horrific. And I know that any police officer in seeing an injury like this would have definitely made an arrest. But I didn't see this injury. If it was, uh, it, apparently it was a selfie taken by Gabby Petito. But we're going to go over the case. And we have covered this case in great detail when it occurred. But this is a, a, a new happening. And it's actually, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty horrific. And this is going to be um, the basis of this really is that Gabby Petito's family are suing the Moab police. And based on their decisions that day, uh, we got to realize that they made a decision not to arrest anyone. In the police report, it's almost like an internal affairs bureau report, except it was uh, investigated by an outside agency, a, a captain, a retired captain, I believe it was potentially even an active captain, he investigated. And one of his findings was that Gabby Petito was the primary aggressor. And he recommended that she should have been arrested or he insinuated or he said in his report that she should have been arrested. But now a lot of things, uh, and everyone has a, a, a deep opinion on this. A lot of things came across that there was a report that uh, Brian Laundrie had smacked her earlier on. But we, as as content creators, didn't have that information when the police pulled her over. When did the police have that information? For me, and I believe for my panelists, Phil Grimaldi and Professor Michael Geary, that would have definitely have changed the whole landscape had we known that. And when did they know that? Phil, what's your opinion on that? Well, I got to tell you, Billy, uh, when I saw that picture today and uh, I quickly read it, uh, it appeared that that picture was taken only hours before the interaction with the police. That was a selfie that was taken that was recovered from Gabby Petito's cell phone, I would imagine. And obviously, when you see that picture, if you're a uniformed police officer that's doing an investigation on a domestic violence call, uh, such of this nature, uh, you see that picture, somebody's going into handcuffs. I, I think Phil, that, just, uh, just for your information, according to Banfield, that picture was taken two minutes before the police, the Moab police, pulled them over. 
Okay. So okay. when was that smack or that grab of her face, which he admitted to? And is right. that what left that, you know, this looks more like, you know, that's like almost like a burn wound, like a real a friction type wound across the face that he hit her with something else other than his hand. Well, it also looks like a smudge of blood across. Maybe when she pulled away, uh, it appears that from her, you know, the corner of her eye. I don't know if the blood is from her or from his hand or whatever. But if you look at that picture, it's just very upsetting to think that that happened prior to the interaction with the police. Perhaps if the police had seen that exact picture, I think things might have gone differently. Would that have prevented the murder of Gabby, Gabby Petito? No one knows the answer to that. Uh, you know, the murder did happen a number of days later. Um, I just wanted to give the description, the definition of domestic violence. I looked it up real quick. Violent or aggressive behavior within the home, typically involving the violent abuse of a spouse or a partner. It doesn't even have to be actual assault or violence. It could just be aggressive behavior. You could fall into the category of domestic violence. And I think that that's the problem with domestic violence. It's not taken as seriously as it should be by the victims a lot of time. The victims always think that they're going to save the abuser. They're going to change them. And uh, unfortunately, there are too many situations where it winds up uh, like the Gabby Petito case where uh, a domestic violence uh, abuse victim winds up dead. All right. M Mike Geary, uh, the same the same question. What is your uh, position on this? Yeah, I think for the uh, police officers that end up going on that call and, and finding them on the side of the road and pulling them over and talking to both. Um, yeah, they didn't see that sort of bruise. If they did, they would have probably taken them into custody brought him back to the station house, you know, had a much more thorough investigation. Uh, one of the problems that you do see a lot, and Phil alluded to this, is that um, sometimes the person who's actually abused will make, will make excuses for the abuser and sometimes will often deny if you ask them, uh, did, he, did he hit you? No, you know, uh, no, 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 no. Um, you know, it was just, a, it was kind of like a consensual argument, uh, you know, this, that sort of thing. And it makes it difficult for police to figure out who was the initial aggressor. And if you remember in the NYPD, sometimes they'd want you to lock everybody up. Yeah. And, you know, you're like, OK, is this really solving the, the, the problem either? It's a difficult situation for police to deal with. And I, I uh, understand how everybody in the situation has been harmed by the situation. And no one feels that there was really any satisfactory uh you know, conclusion to that encounter. You know, I'm going to play Banfield right now. And she did a, this is only like a three th and three minute, 33 second uh, little interview here. Let's play. We'll see what she has to say. There's just this heartbreaking new picture that's emerged in the Gabby Petito case. It is a selfie and it shows the injury to Gabby's face just moments before a wrenching and fateful encounter that you saw on police body cam. This was in Moab, Utah. I do want to warn you that the picture is, is very hard to look at knowing you know, what came just days later. The picture shows Gabby's injuries a lot more clearly than we could see on this body cam. It's hard to tell when we saw these pictures, but Gabby took a picture of herself just two minutes two minutes before those police arrived. And this is the selfie that she snapped. Shows a scratch under her eye and blood sm smudged across her face. You can see tears in her eyes. The picture was released by the law firm that is handling the Petito family's $50 million wrongful death lawsuit against the Moab police. And the suit claims that Gabby Sorry, folks. It's uh, it's freezing up a little bit. The video. I can. I'll remove it uh, unless it stop starts again. I'm gonna remove the video right now. So you, you see, this is uh, it's a. There we go. I'm gonna put it back on the screen. That had been traveling with her, had the Moab police paid closer attention to these injuries and how she must have received these injuries. The lawyers say that Gabby was likely strangled and or suffocated by Brian Laundrie at about the time a caller 
uh, dialed 911 reporting to see her being slapped by Brian Laundrie in a parking lot. Um, you can also tell by that picture that um, Gabby Petito's tank top in the selfie matches the tank top that she's wearing in the back of the police cruiser there on the body cam. So the timing really does line up. The selfie itself was taken at 4.37 in the afternoon. That was August 12th, 2021. So 4.37, the picture snapped. The call to 911 comes in two minutes later. The body cam video starts at 4.53. Did you get hit in the face? Um, kind of looks like something like hit you in the face. I mean, I mean, it's okay if you're saying you hit him, and then I, I understand if he hit you, but we want to know the truth if he actually hit you. Because, you know... I guess, yeah, but I hit him first. There's a, a, a thing that, as police officers, concerns us because these officers are being basically eviscerated in the press that they did the wrong thing. There was a 100-page report on they fought, they didn't follow this rule, they didn't follow that rule. In this case, and I think that Phil and I talked about this in great depth when it happened, I would have locked them both up, unfortunately, because we can't tell who, you know, it's something called the primary aggressor. And in the hundred something page port report that was investigated after the fact here, and you got to realize an investigator has months, months and months to come out with this report. And he has uh 2020 hindsight, of course. He, the investigator said he would have locked up Gabby Petito. I mean, that, that infuriates most of us because it looks when we look at this video, she's the aggrieved party. She's the one with the injuries. I mean, now that we know, of course, two weeks later, she's murdered. You know what, Billy? I think that um, the initial stages of that video, when the first encounter with the police takes place, uh, the officer says that the vehicle struck the curb. So when he uh, finally gets the car pulled over, it swerved and it struck the curb. Then when he gets the car pulled over, he asks what happened. And she says that she smacked the phone out of his hand or something like that. So it did sound in the initial uh, interview, uh, the, uh, the interaction with the two uniform officers in Moab that, um, you know, that she could have been the primary aggressor. But when you look at the way she was, uh, acting in the back of that police car, uh, she wasn't saying he assaulted me or anything like that, but she was just so hysterical. She was so beside herself. There was definitely, uh, an attempt. They, they moved, uh, Gabby away from him. They took her, uh, into the back of a police car with the air conditioning on to calm down. She was hyperventilating. Uh, a female police officer came on the scene. So again, they did try. It looks like they went the extra mile to try and, uh, figure out what transpired, who was the primary primary aggressor. And as we know, further on, they did separate them for the night. However, it didn't lead to a good uh, ending. For you know, you know, Phil, was... I've gone to hundreds of these as a sergeant, as a patrol sergeant. Mike, I'm sure you have yeah. too. Gone to hundreds of these uh, domestic violence incidents. And I would always err on the side of locking of people up because they will look, you know, they're always looking to take a piece of the cop. And if he makes, you know, let's hold, you know, when you think about it, and people may not like this, that I've never worn the uniform or had a gun belt strapped on. Uh, let's blame the cop who has to hold a Supreme Court session on the side of the road here and figure out and apply the law equally and correctly 100% of the time. Mike, what do you think? I think you're right, Billy. Um, if the problem is when you're a uniformed police officer and responding to domestic violence call, you know, I'm going to say not all, but the not all, definitely not all. But there are a great number of cases where you're really not sure who actually started the fight, um, who act and how long has this been going on? Is this part and parcel, unfortunately, of their relationship? There's couples that fight, uh, physically fight for years on end. And the problem is you get an 911 call, you parachute into their life and then you have to sit there and try to make some sort of peace. I was as I was as we were watching the video with the officer, I was thinking back to the days, my days in the four six or as a cop or as a, as a sergeant in the in three oh, um, you know, to cover your butt as a police officer, you'd have to actually arrest both of them. And that's a no win situation either. And so they're put in the position of 
trying to ad lib some sort of remedial measure and they actually had them separate for the night but you can't stop people from getting back together again and she they got she had the opportunity uh to separate herself but she went back with him and you know what if he hadn't killed her you know two weeks later you know if he had killed her say a year later we would never have heard about this but this was so fresh. You can't, you don't have a crystal ball. The officer does not have a crystal ball and you're doing the best you can. And I thought that I was actually, when I looked at it the very first time, I actually thought that the cops were very conscientious. And Mike, we said the same exact thing. They spent over an hour on this job. That's a lot of time. Yeah. And we said that, that we, it looked like we think the cops did a pretty good job. And then you know, yeah. people from the YouTube world and the public and everyone were like, oh, that was horrific. It was so easy to, but you have to apply the law, not mm -hmm. emotion to this. Right. Women, I've had cases where women have uh, seriously injured and shot at their husbands. And they were actually the aggressors in situations at home, domestic situations, and they get locked up. And sometimes people don't want to believe that. They believe that it's 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 always the male that's the aggressor, who's the aggressor, and the female is always the victim. No way. No, no. Not at all. M Mike, let me ask you a quick question because yeah. Bill and I said this many times on uh, on previous shows. We felt that in New York City, now New York City might be a little different than Moab, but uh, 10, 15 minutes on this call, you think, Mike? Or uh, no way an hour and change, right? No, no way an hour and change. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I remember working in the 4-6, you get these calls and you're just trying to calm people down they'll 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 be talking over each other they'll 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 not want to talk to the police after a while the you know the uh we've had women who have gotten um you know best the guy to leave he doesn't want to leave they'll leave sometimes they neither one of them wants to talk to you after a few minutes um you'll lock up one of the one party or the other and then you'll get a civilian complaint that because you lock the other one up yeah 15 minutes would probably be it Really, ten, ten, I, I figure it would be 10 or 15 minutes yeah. either collar made back to the station house, mm -hmm. back to the house, or both parties separated and sent on their way. But again, if we want to play devil's advocate advocate for a second, let's say that they did make an arrest and they arrested Brian and he was released the next day, and then they were killed. Uh Gabby was killed a couple of weeks down the line. Uh right. would there still be a blame to be put on the offices here? I, I don't know if there would be, you know. And probably not. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that. Uh, the only thing better they could have did would have been to arrest either uh, Brian or Gabby or both. But uh, again, they did spend a lot of time and I felt that they, uh, that they did their due diligence, obviously it didn't work out too good, but uh, you know, in my eyes, I don't see that they're so at fault. No, right, I, let, me play, let me play the rest of this yeah. and then we'll discuss it. Yeah. In those videos, Petito, also says that Laundry did not punch her, but that he grabbed her face and cut her with his fingernail. As we all know, police interviewed the couple for more than an hour and then determined that Petito had said she was the aggressor and that Laundry was the victim. So they ordered the couple to separate for the night and there were no charges filed. But roughly two weeks later, Brian Laundry strangled Gabby Petito. And then he took his own life and left behind a confession about a month after Gabby's body was found. I do want to give you this reminder. It's important. And Joe Petito would like you to know this. If you or someone you know is in an abusive relationship and they might need some help, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline. All right, folks, you know, that's, that's the story of what, of what happened. Now, we can all be a 2020 hindsight and say, oh, if the police had arrested Brian Laundry, Gabby Petito would still be alive to this day. No one, no one knows that, you know. And one of the reasons I wanted to cover this tonight, of course, uh, we all have seen Phil, I, Phil and Mike and myself, we've all seen tons more domestic violence than we care to talk about, you know. And we've seen, you know, violence within families, uh, child abuse, all that other stuff, and. It's, it's, it's horrific, you know, and police have to apply the law to this. And from watching this case and from covering this case, I don't really believe that the, the public really understands 
how police have to respond to these things and, and apply the law and within time parameters that they don't have. In this case, in Moab, they had, they had over an hour to respond to this. And the couple was separated and they went on their separate ways. And then they got back together, as Phil said. Right. And it ended horrifically. But what I want to talk about is Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie lived at his home in Florida for over a year with his family, uh, Roberta Laundrie. And what, what, the, what was the father's name was um, uh, uh, Christopher. Christopher, Christopher, Roberta and Christopher <laughs> Laundrie. There was no signs of abuse in that year. I find that extremely hard to believe. I think there was tons of signs of abuse and they just watched it and did nothing about it. And it led to, you know, the escalation of abuse. Abuse always escalates. It never de-escalates. I have to agree with you, Billy. Uh, uh, Gabby Petito lived with the Laundry family for about a year. What transpired in that year? I mean, were they exposed to any of these violent outbursts by Brian and didn't act on it? Uh, did Gabby... Uh, go to them and explain maybe uh, that he was becoming violent. These are the questions that I would have for the laundry family. And a quick statistic, over 500 women annually in the United States are killed during domestic violence incidents. And over 70% of the murders happen after the victim has left. So even after a victim of uh, domestic violence leaves the home or leaves wherever it is that the violence is taking place, that's when 70% of the murders take place, take place. So again, it's a very, uh, serious problem. Um, you know, it's addressed, uh, many different ways. And one of the guests that we had in the past said we had an actual domestic violence survivor. And she said, believe me, there is help. Even the officers that responded, uh, helped me and they directed me in the right way. So again, if you are suffering, uh, from domestic violence, if you're in a domestic violence situation, Reach out. There is help. Absolutely. Corrine Lavallee. Bill, is that why the parents made it hard to find him? You think, listen, my opinion of the laundries, they are dirtbags. They are horrible, horrible people. They knew their son murdered Gabby Petito, yet they told no one. Their lawyer, Stephen Bertolino, he was just as bad, in my opinion. I don't care that he's hiding behind uh, the license to practice law. The advice he gave them and the advice he gave to Brian Laundrie, horrific in my mind. And, you know, he should, he's being sued too. And I think he should be because, you know, when a lawyer gives her, look, Brian Laundrie's, what was his mental state of mind? That lawyer knew he killed her too. You can't, no one's going to convince me that he didn't know. And knowing that he gave him the advice he gave him, hor horrific. Mike, what do you think? Well, that's a hell of a question, Billy. Thank you. <laughs> I know you're an attorney, and uh, <laughs> I was staying away from that one. <laughs> I knew this was come to me. Now, I uh, I just want to pick up on before I answer about the attorney. I want to agree with Phil. You know, living there for a year, they're 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 a young couple. They're living there, she, and strangely, you know, they must have actually had witnessed fights between these two, the two the two young people, Brian and Gabby, and they probably put it down to image. Most, most likely, I think they put it down to immaturity, and they need you know growing pains of the relationship. But interestingly, that was her car. She could, she actually did have the means to actually leave, but I think because the two of them were very, very um, immature and that there was some physical confrontations in that house. I seriously doubt that the, that the injury that she sustained to her uh, eye and that in incident in Moab was the absolute first time that they ever um, had a fight. And there they are uh, having, you know, having a fight in their uh, videotaping themselves, having a good time, you know, days later and two weeks later, she ends up, she ends up dead. Um, so I think it's a, a terrible, uh, you know, conglomeration of a whole bunch of factors in uh, unhealthy factors in the laundry house. And uh, as far as the attorney's concerned, um, what he should have done. I knew you were going to get to it. <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I'm dying, but I got to get to it. Um, I think his, his, his advice was horrific. I think the best advice he could have given laundry is, look, I'm a civil attorney. I'm not a criminal attorney. I will help you get a criminal attorney right now, but you have to take care of this. This is on your shoulders. You can't you bring anyone else into this. You can't bring in your, your mother, father into this. You got to, and you got to basically man up, do what you have to do, 
go to the police station. We'll get an attorney, you know, that sort of thing. You can have an attorney every step of the way, but you actually have to respond. Uh, and the idea that um, the uh, the attorney helped uh, write statements about, well, uh, we hope that Gabby's okay out there, you know, that she's some, she'll, we'll, she'll return, we'll find her someday. That was so disingenuous. If they disbarred him, I, I, I would be very pleased. I think he deserves it. You know, I really do. Yeah. Because first of all, I, I could tell, why was he doing all these interviews on Banfield and all these other stations? Because he had what I call as media disease. Yes. He loved the spotlight. And he, but he, he really, the more he went on television, the more he looked foolish because mm -hmm. he wasn't a good attorney and his advice was horrific, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and his advice yeah. led to Gabby Petito dead and uh, Brian Laundrie committing suicide. Excellent mm -hmm. attorney. You know, that's the guy I want to hire, you know? Yeah. And I just wanted to mention one thing. When people are in domestic violence incidents, it's almost like, especially females, something called Stockholm Syndrome. And it's when it's when a uh, a victim identifies with their captor. Yes. And you can compare a lot of things in domestic violence to that, to Stockholm system, uh, syndrome. And the victim is afraid to leave and doesn't see how they can survive without this abusive person. It's really a psychological condition, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 terrible. She, and she actually, unfortunately, she actually had the means. She actually had a vehicle. She could actually just. Could drive he, was, he was a, a loafer. She was the go-getter. She was the hard worker. She had all the talent. He was just a, a loser. And, yeah. you know, she didn't, maybe she didn't have enough confidence in herself she to didn't. leave this guy because yeah. she, you know, she should have ran from him. Not, she didn't have to run. It was a van. She mm -hmm. should have sped across the country without him. Right. You know? You, you know, Billy, he displayed uh, like a, a loan attendancy and uh, that one of our friends talked about, this was early on, how uh, he was possessive of her when she wanted to go out with her friends one night. He took her identification. So she was going to go to a bar with her friends. He took her ID and hit it. Uh, again, those are all telltale signs of uh, someone who is uh, in a, a possible uh, abusive relationship. You know, when someone's that possessive, they try to stop you from doing something, you you know, moving about your free will. Uh, no good. No good. That's the time to get up and run. Absolutely. Right. This is a report on the actual report on the, Mo the Moab police and how they, the wrongdoing that was found in the investigation. A newly released review confirms Moab police did not follow the law when they failed to cite Gabby Petito for domestic violence after she and Brian Laundry were seen arguing last August. Fox 13. Sorry, guys, this thing is uh, is going loading and going to sleep for a second. So basically, the report uh, is about we, well, you heard the, the reporter talk about how the findings were that Gabby Petito was the um, primary aggressor and that she should have been arrested. So if I had any discretion of this, I would separate you guys for the day and just give you warnings to stop hitting each other. <laughs> but I lawfully don't have discretion here. Yet veteran Moab police officer Eric Pratt and the new officer he was training, primary Daniel aggressor. Robbins, did let Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie go. The report by a Price Utah police captain says that, by law, Petito should have been cited or arrested once officers determined she was the aggressor. The see, in that body camera, you cannot see that injury anywhere. So, I mean, it was taken uh, two minutes before they were pulled over, but maybe she put makeup on it or something to cover it up. Captain sustained or confirmed multiple complaints where Pratt and Robbins failed to follow the law and Moab's own policies, including failing to obtain witness statements and properly documenting the roadside investigation. Petito's death has been ruled a homicide. With her boyfriend, Brian Laundry dead, there is no more effort to determine who killed her. Here on what's labeled page two, the captain takes a moment to ponder, would Gabby be alive today if this case was handled differently? That is an impossible question to answer. For his part, Pratt told the captain he worried taking Petito to jail would embolden Laundry. So if he's going to go bail her out, is he not going to have more control over her now? Pratt's quoted as saying. In your experience, how legitimate a fear is that?
there are times where victims have been arrested because they're trying to defend. So as you can see, Jen Oxborough is a clinical social worker who's worked with domestic violence victims. And we can see from this report that it's very difficult sometimes for law enforcement to discern exactly what's going on. It doesn't do us any good. It doesn't help us. There's something so, up with YouTube, Billy. Yeah, there's something. I'm going to pull this uh, right now. Um, so, yeah, it's this report. I mean, I would think that most of you guys that are listening to this are somehow infuriated by this report when the investigator finds that Gabby Petito is the primary aggressor. It, it sort of makes me a little bit like, and I, but I understand because I've been on those scenes where I couldn't tell and I locked both of them up. Did that solve the problem? Well, guess what it did do? It relieved the NYPD of civil liability. I didn't get sued. And that's sometimes you have to make decisions based on that, that you could potentially get sued. So apply the law to the strictest level possible in anticipation of something you cannot predict. You know, Billy, when this thing first broke, we only saw little bits of that uh, that encounter with the police. The encounter was over an hour long. And from those little bits, we both felt that possibly she could have been arrested at that point because we didn't have the information of the 911 caller saying that uh, they observed the male slapped the female. We didn't have a lot of the information. And uh, the, the part about the car swerving, hitting the curb, and then she says she tried to grab the steering wheel or she tried to grab the phone out of his hand, something of that nature. So again, it did seem seem at first that she could have been the primary aggressor. Now, obviously, in hindsight, we have a lot more detail, a lot more facts. And now we have this picture today that, that was published in the newspaper uh, because of the lawsuit. And you see her face and it looks bloody and it looks like she's uh, kind of slapped around. And it's clear that there could have been arrest made by, uh, of Brian Laundry. You know, my only problem with this is that it, it's... It's easy for us to sit here and easy for other people to watch this and say, oh, you could see she was an abused person. It's screaming out at you, you know. But unfortunately, the police have to apply the law, not emotion. Professor Mike, what do you think? Yeah, it's a very, it's very difficult. That I, when I talk to my students about you know, domestic violence cases, um, I, I always remind them it's, a, it's, it's not even a fine line between love and hate. Sometimes it's a it's a, you know, a perforated line, you know, dots and stuff like that. And sometimes couples go back and forth between the lines between love and hate while the police officers are there. They're saying things one minute. The next minute they're saying something contradictory. One minute they're 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 yelling at each other. Next minute they're embracing. Um, and to say that it's screaming out or like, oh, can't you how could you not see that she is absolutely the abused one? It could be and it could be that. They got into a fight while they were driving. She grabbed the phone, whatever. Uh, maybe she grabbed it, threw it on the threw it on the floor. Maybe he reached over and smacked her with her with his arm. And then she so and then so she may have done something and then an aggravated the situation. And then he aggravated it even further. The police officers, they're on the side of the road. Remember that they don't live there. They're on the side of the road. These officers are sheriff's deputies. They're coming out there on the side of the road. And these people don't aren't even part of the state. They're traveling through the state to ad lib on the side of the road for an hour and get the people to separate for overnight. I honestly, I know that I'm going to, you know, there's a lot of heat, but I don't think the police officers did anything wrong. I, I really don't either. Lou Lemorocco, thank you so much for the $10 super chat. Thank, thank you, you so much for your support. I know you're a, a brand new YouTube channel member. We appreciate all our channel members. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff. Real crime stories, if you like real crime from a police perspective, then you're in the right place. Uh, and if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and ring that bell. And share us with your friends, your family. Bring everyone in. Have a little picnic with police off the cuff. And if you want to support us financially, we have a Patreon with three different levels. And we also have a YouTube channel membership with five different levels. And you see the folks in the chat our very important YouTube channel members in the green font, they support us too. We appreciate all you guys. Yeah, I, I just, you know, the only thing that really concerns me a lot, well, a lot of things concern me with this case, but in the way it was handled, 
it always, in my mind, it always falls that the, the only um, organization, the only government agency that's ever held accountable to the deepest letter of the law is the police department. You know, everyone else, their, their incompetence is just accepted. The police department is held to the highest, highest standard there is. And people may not see this until you wear that badge and strap on that gun and you realize how the level that you are held accountable to, you, you could, if you could do something wrong at work and get arrested, how many other jobs can you do that on? You know, you make a mistake at work and next thing you know, you got handcuffs on and, uh, or you're sued in a civil case. In this case, they're being sued for $50 million. You know, it's, uh, it's something to think about. Billy, let me just make a quick point about domestic violence. Uh, one of the most uh, calls for service for uniformed police officers is domestic violence calls. I think that's the highest number of calls for service. And again, uh, it's probably one of the most dangerous situations that police officers can be placed in. Uh, you're taught in the police academy that if you're going to do a domestic violence between two people, that you try to separate them, but that you try to, both officers should try to face each other so that way you don't have your back to the other side. Uh, Mike, you talked about how uh, cases have gone sideways where you're talking to uh, one victim and, uh, you know, you go to talk to the aggressor and now that victim becomes an aggressor on you, tries to attack you when you say you're going to arrest, uh, yeah. you know, the boyfriend or whatever it was. I had a situation where a, a, a sister called the police on her brother. It was Christmas Day. There were no sectors other than a North car and a South car and a 7 precinct back in 1983. My partner and I responded. Uh, the guy had two different knives. We were probably justified to shoot him. Uh, we were able to uh, use restraint. We didn't shoot him. Uh, became a little bit of a wrestling match after the second knife was displayed. Uh, while we're wrestling the knife out of this uh, individual's hand, the sister that called the police because the brother was completely out of control, threatening to kill the family. I feel somebody pulling my hair from behind. It was obviously the sister. So again, quickly, the people that called the police that were looking for help can now become the aggressor against the police. And Mike, you said it, we've seen it happen many, many times. So these situations, the point I'm trying to make is for the police, they're very volatile, they're extremely dangerous, and they could go from a little bit of a screaming match to a deadly encounter. I want to show a little bit of the laundry attorney again on uh, Ashley Banfield, just to see what he was like. Billy's favorite. <laughs> so Brian, we're not going to get to the bottom of this. You know, I'll get past the fact that Ashley won't concede that what was said out of Josh Taylor's own mouth was that I may have said it in passing and that he does not know. YouTube is uh, not cooperating tonight, guys, with this. Uh, yeah. Let me let me remove this. But, well, just, just know that this attorney uh, gave a lot of bad. Let me add it back. What I will tell you, Brian, is we were not, at that moment, we were not concerned that Brian, you know, had hurt himself or wasn't coming home. You know, Chris and Roberta had indicated to me that Brian had gone out camping and hiking for multiple days many, many times. Yeah, yeah, I just killed my girlfriend. Let me go camping and hiking. And by the way, when this was going on, I went to the Mayakahatchee Preserve. And it's a really intimidating place. There's those wild pigs. I didn't see any, but I was told there's wild pigs, alligators, all kinds of crazy animals in there. And I was videoing it as I walked in there and all my YouTube subscribers going, Sergeant Bill, don't go in there. Don't go. I said, I don't have a gun. And they, please don't go in there. And it was a spooky, spooky place. And this was allegedly where he went camping after he just killed his girlfriend and they knew it. And they were making up all these stories. Unbelievable, Billy. I just want to make a quick point about the attorney. Now, uh, let's say that Brian Laundry didn't tell his parents he killed his girlfriend. Let's say he didn't tell the attorney that he killed Gabby. But you know, listen, you're not stupid. Uh, he returns on September 1st with her van. Uh, the family's been trying, you know, just about every minute of the day, trying to contact 
uh, the laundry family to find out where Gabby is. They hadn't heard from her in days. So it's not that much of a leap or an assumption to say that perhaps there was some harm done to her by Brian. Why would you let him out of your sight? You you have to assume that he did something to her. Why would you let him out of your sight? I give it to the parents that they, they were reckless in that. And as well as the attorney. The attorney should have said, listen, like Mike said, uh, let's get an attorney. We're going to go into the police station. We'll, we'll tell them that we're, uh, invoking counsel. We don't know where Gabby is and we'll wait to see what happens. Obviously there would have been an arrest at some point and maybe they'd be visiting Brian in jail today, as opposed to going to a cemetery. Exactly. A good point. He was a young man. They weren't concerned. They thought he was clearing the air, clearing his mind. It wasn't until we got the call on Friday that there was a tip he was seen in Tampa that we were concerned. Then why did you why did you report it to the FBI, Mr. Brutal? You know, if they, they thought he needed to clear his mind and he's an avid hiker and camper, why were you calling or talking to them on Monday night or Tuesday morning saying, yikes, he hasn't come home? Why, why is it an issue? Actually, nobody, actually, nobody said, yikes, he hasn't come home, Ashley. <laughs> so let's why would you that. report it to the FBI if he didn't no, come home, Ashley. if he just needed to clear his mind? Lose the word report. I was having oh man, she she killed him in this interview. She a couple did of times a day on those few days. What I said to you was in my conversation with the FBI, either Monday night or Tuesday morning, I mentioned to the FBI that by the way, Brian didn't come home. As part of that conversation, I was reminded today from the FBI. Th this is why lawyer and liar sound alike. Oh, <laughs> he nice. said, yes, I remember distinctly because you said to me, would you come home with all those press in front of your house? He okay, got it. Contacted so, the FBI, specifically if reminded I can, me of that I want to keep you over the break. I'm, I'm losing commercial breaks, and it's a, it's a machine I can't stop, but I... So that, that was one of the interviews, I think, that um, Banfield just destroyed this guy. His lies, he couldn't even lie straight. And he got confused with his lies. And, you know, it's it's just, uh, it, to me, it was horrific. But it, to me, it showed who this guy was. And, and when you think of all the things he knew and the time that he knew it, and this is the lies he was telling then. And, you know, he's a lawyer. So, you know, lawyers, we expect it. But the family was all, <laughs> Mike doesn't like that. <laughs> I hope that Joe Murray isn't watching this episode. Oh, I, I purposely wouldn't have Joe Murray on with this because he'd be going, what are you kidding me? You know? <laughs> me and Joe Murray are going to double team you. Oh, okay. Uh-oh, uh-oh, look out. You, you know, Billy, listen, that lawyer, uh, he just... My impression is that he was out of his league. He might have got caught up in the spotlight. You know, it was a major national case. Uh, every media outlet was trying to get a hold of him. He spoke to Ashley Banfield. And, uh, you know, I don't know how much criminal law he practiced. I believe he was a civil attorney. But again, um, saying less is always better in situations like this, especially if you're a defense attorney for someone that you know, very likely knows the whereabouts of a missing person, perhaps was even involved in the, the, the fact that this person is missing. So less was better. Uh, uh, he really, uh, he was out of his field and I think he got caught up in the moment and uh, Ashley Barenfield certainly tripped him up. Absolutely. Cindy J, why is he still lying about it? Well, Cindy, this was a video from back when it happened, but if you've uh, been following this, he's getting sued civilly also. Yes. So, he would be advised by his own attorney to keep his mouth shut. And, you know, attorneys are just as bad as others that get that media disease. They get on television. They just can't stop talking, you know. And if you keep talking, at some point you're going to incriminate yourself or you're going to tell a lie. There's just no way it's not, you know, you can't do it. And that's what he did. You know, he just was going on too many TV shows. What do you think, Mike? I think you're right. We've seen this um, with the uh, attorney for the Gonzalez family in the Idaho murder cases. You know, less is more out in public with attorneys. Attorneys should be talking, whispering in people's ears, talking behind the scenes to people, giving people advice, not standing in front of a microphone, giving an interview because they, as you say, they get that, that, the taste for the microphone and the spotlight and they're thinking of their career and what they could parlay this into and, you know, that's often it's a selfish it's a, they're serving themselves rather than their 
than their clients. And, and that's pathetic. This attorney is facing a uh, part of a lawsuit for, you know, uh, his participation and what the uh, what the Petitos believe is like a, a conspiracy with the family to um, cause pain and su- pain and suffering to them by not being candid for for several weeks. And, um, you know, if he's found liable, that's the end of his career. It's over. It's well, over. you know, Mike, did, did not even uh, it wasn't even that the uh, laundry family. Uh, was high. They weren't taking the calls. Right. They, they were, weren't taking calls from Gabby Petito's family. Could you imagine that? You're calling and they won't take your calls. And they and wouldn't cooperate. With some returns with your daughter's van and they're not taking your calls. Are right. you kidding me? Right. That, that's why I think there was such a tidal wave against the laundries because, listen, ethically, as a parent, uh, my kid is living in your house for a year. Uh, my kid, I can't get a hold of her. I start to reach out to you to see if you can get a hold of Brian, her fiance, and you don't take my call. And then when when eventually the, 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 the I believe it was the stepfather knocks on the door, they basically tell him we don't know anything and they slam the door in his face. I mean, come on, that's fucking horrible. Excuse my language. I, I'm yeah. just getting caught up in the moment. But uh, I, I can't even believe that they could have done such a thing to that family. Listen, they could have said, Brian's here. The van is here. We have no idea where Gabby is. And that could have been enough. They didn't even do that. They didn't even do the bare minimum. I just get infuriated with those people. It was terrific. You know, in this case, though, there were, there was two heroes in this case. And it was the Red, White, and Bethune. I'm just going to play a little bit of this because these were the greatest people during this whole case. More toward the back because we had heard the views were better back there. So we were heading back on this long dirt gravel road. And we came across a white van that had Florida plates, a small white van. We were going to stop and say hi because we're from Florida too, but the van was completely dark. There was nobody there. So we decided to continue on our way. Yeah, the van looked like it was pretty much uh, kind of abandoned. We figured maybe they were out hiking or they were just chilling inside. There was no doors open. You know, it was just um, just kind of, you know, neat to see a Florida plate, you know, on the other side of the country. It's not something you see all the time. But we wanted to include this in the video just in any way that we can help and get this out there to be able to find Gabby Petito. So if you could share it, if you know anything um please don't hesitate yeah we're as we're coming up on it we're approaching it up here on the left hand side this is most definitely gabby petito's ford transit van it's kind of wild like it's sane a little bit because we drove past we actually weren't able to find any sites and we ended up driving back through saw it again but here it is on the left so and i slowed it down so you can possibly see it a little bit better uh, kind of freaky for a late Saturday evening. <laughs> Pretty amazing, right? Those those were the heroes of this case that had they not spotted that, well, actually it was on their, um, their video that they were videoing as they went along and they reviewed it and they said, oh, what's that? And they were able to spot her. And that was how it led to the police and the FBI going and finding her body maybe a couple hundred yards from, from that van. Just think if they never spotted that van. You know, How- Billy, the power of social media, because they saw on social media that Gabby was missing. They saw a picture of the vehicle. It was described in the uh, the news article that they saw. And then they said, you know what? We've been in that area. Let's go back and look at our video. Sure enough, they reviewed a video and they find the vehicle. They notify the authorities. And then, as you said, uh, a search is conducted in that area. And shortly thereafter, Gabby Petito's body was found. Um, again, uh, not alive, but, uh, who knows how long it would have been if it wasn't for the Bethunes, uh, finding, you know, going through their video and looking through that and seeing, uh, that vehicle and bringing it to the attention of law enforcement when she would have been found. Well, you know, 100%. And, you know, I, uh, I was on the show with duty Ron and, uh, these folks are, uh, they're amazing people. They're really, you know, they they travel the country with their three kids and their three dogs, in this big, like, I guess, uh, almost like a tour bus 
And uh, that's what they do with their lives. It's pretty amazing. And uh, I think they have over 200,000 subscribers on their YouTube. So they're doing pretty well with it, you know. But yeah, yeah. Look, this, I was on a show with Duty Rana and them as well. They seem to be very nice people. Like you said, they're uh, traveling across the country and they document their uh, their travels on their YouTube site. So, uh, again, very, very important to the whole case. 100%. You know, folks, if, we, if anything we can learn from this is, uh, you know, domestic violence. If, any, if you're in an abusive relationship, you can't put up with it. No one should be putting their hands on you. No one should be hitting you. I used to teach at a college that was all inner city kids. And I would say that all the time to them. No one should be putting their hands on you. And I could see in the faces of these kids that what I was saying to them was getting through to them. But I could see some of them were in, in abusive relationships. I could just read it in their faces, you know. And I, I would always reiterate that if you have a problem with someone doing that to you, come to me. You can talk to me about it, all right? And a lot of kids did come to me. I was trusted. A lot. Like, Mike, you know it, too. A lot of yes. kids, students, they trust you, you know? They come and talk kids to you after class, yeah. Yeah, kids would come to my office and tell me horrific things, you know? You're an authority figure. You're the teacher. So I, I guess it makes sense of, yeah. of that to, to do that. You know, Billy, one of the things that we learned when we were doing these shows back when uh, this case was first going on was the universal sign for help. If, if someone's in a situation where they can't, uh, tell a police officer or or someone that they need help. There's a universal sign where they just hold their hand up. At least if I get in front of them, you tuck the thumb and you close the fist. That's the universal sign for I need help. It's the hand with the thumb in and close the fist. Uh, I believe there was someone that was uh, telling a story about how they uh, they saw a police officer when they were in a bad situation. The police officer asked if they were okay. They said yes, but had they had this uh, you know universal sign. Uh, maybe they it would have prevented the abuse that they were going to go through. So again, uh, one of the things that we learned on this case regarding domestic violence. But, you know, many things that I learned about domestic violence from my time on the police department too, is that people that are in abusive um, situations, many times they'll get out of that abusive situation and they'll hook up with someone that is just as abusive as the guy they just left. So I think there's some kind of, a psychological profile to it. Uh, and I'm not saying they're looking to be abused. I just think it's something in their psyche that attracts them to that type of person. Professor Mike, I can see the cogs churning in your brain right now. What do you think? I think on some levels, you're right. Uh, people who are in abusive relationships, not all, but many of them have been in previous abusive relationships and may have experienced abusive relationships as a child and seeing their parents and, or, you know, that sort of thing, uh, engaging in some abuse. So for us, if you're not involved in an abusive situation and you come across it, you think how horrible, why don't you get out? But for some people, uh, an abusive relationship, physical, verbal abuse, or the combination of two is actually kind of, kind of normal and par for the course in a terrible way. And they don't see perhaps, uh, that getting out is going to change their lives, you know, uh, and they've accepted it for a long enough time. And if they've got children in common and families that are intertwined in common, sometimes there's a lot of pressure just to stay in that relationship and try to work it out the best you can. And it's kind of like a reoccurring cyclical kind of thing. It goes and comes and goes. It gets better. There's a honeymoon phase. Then it gets back into abuse again. Then it peaks and it gets back into a honeymoon phase again. And unfortunately, sometimes that's how that's how the humans adapt their 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 brain to this sort of thing. It's you just accept it. You know, one of the things, Mike, and I see people in the chat talking about it. We're not making light of it, how no, hard it all. is for someone to leave, especially, you know, your the abuser could be the breadwinner. The mm -hmm. abuser could be, you know like you said, the honeymoon phase could be nice to you and erupts every month or every two or th three months. But once someone puts their hands on you, they've shown you their cards. They've yeah. shown you who they are. And again, I'm making it sound much easier, but you got to go. You got to leave. There, It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. I guarantee that. No, Phil said what he talked about, the controlling attitude, the dominating attitude by taking somebody's wallet, taking their ID, 
quite often taking money, hiding keys. You know, as Phil pointed out, that, that's a that's a bad sign. At, when that happens, that's a controlling type of uh, personality. And then from that point to abuse, physical or verbal abuse, is a real small bridge at that point. Y well, you know, not only like, was he physically abusive, he was mentally abusive to her, yeah. you know. Yeah, he, he was definitely controlling. Mike, I can remember uh, of the many domestic violence cases that I handle, uh, there would be what Billy just said, you know, a person who's kind of the breadwinner and they're controlling. They would uh, almost keep the, the other person in the relationship on a very short leash. Uh, yeah. Don't allow them to work, take care of the kids and, you know, uh, again, cut them off, alienate them from friends and stuff like that. And eventually when this person would get assaulted or whatever and injured and would, the police would be involved. Uh, we would try to, you know, make the arrest and try to coax them through and counsel them. And then you had the other type of uh, domestic violence victim where uh, the, uh, the abuser would apologize afterwards and I'm not mm -hmm. going to do it again. And it's because of what happened to me in the past. And they would always be trying to save that person. And it would happen. You know, yeah. we'd see the same face in the office two and three and four and five times uh, same complainant, uh, you know, being abused and arresting the same uh, perpetrator for it. And it was really like, like you said, it was like a cycle. Yeah. And uh, yeah. unfortunately, uh, they usually get worse. They don't get better. So if someone thinks that they're going to save uh, or they're going to change that person, usually not the case. It's very difficult to change someone that's in that type of a uh, yeah. relationship. Lucia, thank you for the 199 super chat. The cop said to her, what happened to your eye? Well, they both admitted to assaulting each other, basically. Right. And the officers basically made a decision not to make an arrest, to separate them, which used to be the way to do it back in the day. Yeah. And then it, because uh, domestic homicides had risen so high, I believe, in the 80s and 90s, they came up with basically a must-arrest policy on almost all domestic violence incidents. Yeah, Billy, the, the Nicole Brown Simpson and the Ronald Goldman homicide, double homicide involving O.J. Simpson, that's when I saw the turning point. I was in the detective bureau for about three or four years before that case. After that case uh, took place, that's when everything seemed to change. The must, uh, must arrest. No, I, I think it was sooner than that. I think it was the head of Nussbaum case. That changed. Well, well, that was that was a child abuse case, right? Man. But it was also a domestic violence yes, case. Yes, she was yes. beaten beyond recognition. Yeah. Well, be, before O.J. Simpson case, before Nicole uh, Nicole Brown Simpson case, we were able to refer uh, domestic violence if it was misdemeanor, right? Slap exactly. or a punch or a kick. We were able to refer it to family court if the person didn't want to uh, press charges against the the person that committed the assault. But if it was a felony, that was that was a, uh, an arrest right. situation. But I think after uh, the Nicole Brown Simpson case, the district attorney became the complainant on the case. They would say, must the arrest situation will be the uh, deponent on the case. And again, uh, did it save lives? Yes, it probably did, because there's so much domestic violence in, uh, you know, in these bad neighborhoods, in the inner cities. So again, uh, was it a good policy? Yeah, but I definitely saw the change then around that time. I think that you're right. Uh, the head of Nussbaum case that brought to light, uh, domestic violence, obviously child abuse in that case. Uh, uh again, very, 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 uh, I think that case. was like 84, 85. That, that was a long occurred. time. Yeah. That was yeah, Irma, Irma Rivera was involved in that. I remember, do you see pictures of her from back then? She, she's like a, a little kid, you know? Uh, yeah. But that, yeah, that was a long time ago. Uh, Phil, you want to just uh, do the Joe Murray uh, commercial? Joe Murray, attorney at law, have you found yourself in a jam? Are you in need of legal counsel in the New York area? Do you need a victim's advocate? I think victim's advocate fits with tonight's show. Joe Murray is your man. He's not only an experienced trial attorney, he's also a retired 15-year member of the NYPD. He literally knows both sides of defense. His website is jmurray-law.com. His telephone number is 646-838-1702. Or you could email Joe at joe at jmurray-law.com. We kid around about uh, attorneys uh, from time to time on the show, but Joe Murray is a terrific criminal defense attorney. We have Professor Mike Geary, Geary who's also a terrific attorney. We've had Mike Vecchione on, who is a, a, a tremendous uh, attorney and uh, criminal prosecutor. So we'll tip our hat to them, uh, <laughs> even though we do ribbon and, and kid I didn't really mean that lawyer and liar sound alike. <laughs> but I do I like that, it. Billy. I got to admit. <laughs> 
when I need an attorney, I'll say I never said that. <laughs> Let's just right, say guys. there's been many misstatements that came out of attorney's <laughs> mouth. Guys, we're going to uh, wind it up. Uh, Mike, I'm going to start with you. Your final thoughts. Final thoughts. Uh, I think uh, the Gabby Petito, Brian Laundry case is uh, a good case to just to remind people, as Phil's done, uh, if you're in an abusive relationship, it's never going to get better. You're not going to save the person. You need to get out. You need to save your life. You need to move on because that per that controlling person is going to make it's going to just get worse and worse and worse. So please get out. Absolutely. Phil, final words. Looking at that picture today, it absolutely infuriated me and broke my heart to think that that young, beautiful kid was being abused by uh, Brian. And unfortunately, she couldn't get out of the situation alive. Uh, there it is. There's that picture. Uh, if you have children, I have three daughters, uh, and that doesn't uh, choke you up or make you become emotional, then uh, I think you're a very cold person. Again, I'm just going to echo what Mike said. If you're in an abusive relationship, we were uh, big advocates of reaching out for help. We had an actual domestic violence survivor on the show uh, back sometime last year. And uh, she also reiterated, there is help out there. Reach out. Uh, get a hold of uh, your local police. There's many, many different uh, groups that will help uh, survivors and uh, victims of domestic violence. Absolutely. Phil, I just want to give you a chance to uh, do a, uh, a little tribute to Officer Adid Fayez, his pictures on the screen. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yesterday, uh, Officer Fayez uh, succumbed to his injuries that he sustained Sunday night. He was uh, out in uh, East New York, Brooklyn, uh, he was actually off duty. He was uh, trying to purchase a vehicle that was posted on Facebook marketplace. Uh, he went to the location. It was a setup for a robbery. The perpetrator uh, shot him in the head uh, and fled. He was captured, however, within uh, 46 hours after the shooting by the NYPD Detective Bureau. Uh, and his handcuffs were taken from his locker and placed on the perpetrator. Uh, hopefully there'll be justice and this perpetrator will be found guilty and spend the rest of his miserable life in jail. God bless uh, Officer Fayez and his Fiaz. family. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame that uh, he left, I believe, three children. He was a young officer, supposedly loved by everybody in the 66 precinct in Brooklyn. And again, uh, God bless his soul and God bless his family. Absolutely. Folks, um, tonight at nine o'clock, I want to implore all you guys to join duty ron he has a really excellent guest uh a, a phd dr joni i forget dr joni's last name but she's a behavioral analyst they're going to talk about some of that re brian koberger uh they got a, a really special guest a real handsome guy coming on their show hey uh, i wonder who that guy be. sergeant bill cannon is gonna be a, be a guest on the show so if uh if you if you got more time to watch duty ron show at nine o'clock you're welcome to come aboard, and I'll be there. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We hope we uh, did a little justice to this case and just uh, explained some things that are really almost inexplainable sometimes. So thanks for tuning in tonight. Everyone have a safe night, and God bless. Stay safe, everyone, and Gabby, rest in peace. One episode.